Thank you. I'm Dominique Thompson, and I'm just going to set the context for you a little bit about the younger generation and what is happening for them. In the 1970s, one in seven young people went to universities. In the 1980s, it was one in five. It's now one in two. And one in four of those graduates will get a first. These may be some of the reasons that young people feel under increasing pressure when leaving university and entering the workforce. Young people entering the workplace direct from school are also under pressure, whether it's costs of living, competition from graduates, and the threat to jobs from technology. I spent almost 20 years as a university GP caring for students. And I developed a special interest in mental health, partly driven by the fact that 50% of UK university GP consultations are now for a mental health problem. In my case, because I had a special interest, nine out of 10 of my consultations every day were for mental health problems. I saw for myself the daily challenges for young adults managing, for example, an eating disorder or bipolar disorder. And I'm so pleased to be here to facilitate this session today, looking at how we can better support young people moving into the workplace. Young women now have a one in four chance of having a common mental illness, such as anxiety, self-harm, or depression, at any time that they are asked in surveys. In their male peers, it's one in 10, but they are sadly much more likely to take their own lives. Three out of four deaths by suicide are by males. The media has highlighted how universities are now having to cope with a mushrooming of mental health distress like never before, with student suicides rising. We have also seen perfectionism, a trait linked to me multiple mental health disorders, such as anxiety, depression, OCD, and eating disorders, rise by more than 30% over the last 30 years in the young adult population around the world. It is fear of failure that is creating a huge pressure on an already stressed generation. They have high expectations of themselves, but also are desperate to live up to the expectations of their increasingly involved parents and families. Parents are now going to interviews with their graduate kids. Tuition fees and debt play a significant role in amplifying the pressure. So mental health matters to the young generation and they are breaking down stigma like never before. They also clear that they believe employers have a responsibility to support their well-being in the workplace and will consider leaving and finding new work if these needs are not met. So the key is to remember that normalizing mental health, it's not just about inclusivity and sensitivity, it can save lives. It allows people to talk. On a positive note, a recent study from the Business Disability Forum stated that if businesses reflect the values and attitudes of their youngest employees, they will create great loyalty. This is a generation prepared to work hard for their employers. So, on this complex and challenging background, we'd like to share with you some of the positive things that you can do within your organizations, and we'd like you to offer you some of the practical top tips from the youngest generation themselves. Okay, are we ready? Yeah. All right. So, we'll start with a question about your experience of talking about mental health in the workplace. Uh, Daniel, would you like to start? Yeah, of course. So, um, to give a bit of context about how I got to speak about uh, mental health in the workplace, my background is that I'm pretty sure that I've wrestled with depression from the age of 13. Um, I attempted to take my own life when I was 17. Um, I was diagnosed as clinically depressed when I was 22 following the suicide of one of my good female friends. Um, I didn't go to university until I was 21 because of everything that was going on. Um, I joined Thomas Reuters in, when I was 25, five years ago. I know I don't look 30, so. um, and um, I became aware of the problem of mental, mental ill health uh, around 
26, 27, when all the statistics were coming out about male suicide. Um, when I got to 25, 26, I kind of got myself into a really good place mentally of where I felt stable, comfortable, content, and all the rest of it. So I decided to make a big leap um, in 2016 to write a blog about my personal experience and share it on our internal intranet system. Um, okay. That blog went viral on our yeah. intranet. Um, had no idea things could go viral on, yeah. on the intranet, which is great. Um, but <laughs> I've now had, I think, over 5,000 people have viewed that blog. I had emails from India, Australia, South Africa, all over the place, and it was really overwhelming. So clearly, there was a massive need to kind of talk about it more. So since then, I've been kind of on this mission with Thomson Reuters to kind of really raise awareness about the subject, to think about practical solutions in the workplace, and it's been a great journey. And if you would have told my 17-year-old self I'd be sitting on the stage today, he would have laughed in your face. So. <laughs> well, well done. Thank you. Um, Charlo, would you like to say something about your experiences? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess I've got to be honest, I, I grew up in a South Asian background, so when I was growing up, mental health just didn't exist, and I can truthfully say I didn't believe it was a thing, I thought it was stupid, and I, I thought you should just get on with things. So when I joined PwC over seven years ago, I joined at 18 on their school leaver scheme, and I had the same pressures as probably most of you guys here, we have to pay our bills, we have to, um, we have family expectations, even just getting the tube into work. These are daily stresses, and actually it only takes one thing to tip you over the edge, and unfortunately that's what happened to me. I just didn't recognize that at the time. Um, several years ago, um, something very, very bad happened to my family. Um, I won't talk about the details here, but I guess to give you some sort of scale, on a scale of one to 10 of how bad it was, it was probably a 12. Um, and I, I really struggled. I couldn't concentrate at work. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. And I didn't realize what was happening. I was a very high achiever. I was on fast track for promotion. And I couldn't let anybody know because I didn't trust anybody. I thought it would go around as gossip to my direct team. So I chose to internalize that struggle. Um, so six months down the line, um, I reached breaking point, And unfortunately, I missed a deadline. Um, and what's funny is it wasn't a huge legal tax deadline. It was just one of those little internal ones, but it was picked up because I never made mistakes. Um, I, I ended up, uh, first time in my career, having just a complete emotional breakdown uh, in front of my people manager or your line manager. And he immediately cocooned me. He got HC involved. And my biggest fear was my local team these are the people I work with essentially on a day-to-day -day basis, them finding out, them spreading rumors, them spreading gossip, and unfortunately that, that did happen, but actually HC got involved, they stopped the gossiping and said this was not allowed to be discussed. I was given flexible working, I was taken out of the workforce for a period of time to kind of look after myself, but also deal with what had happened back home. Um, but I guess I still didn't disclose to my team, so I think, I, it's important that, yes, people have issues, but they don't actually have to directly disclose to their local team as long as HC put in place the, the right things. Thank you. That's really helpful and enlightening. And it's interesting that you've had you know, quite different experiences. Um, so I wonder, maybe, Daniel, could you say a little bit about why you think your peers might not disclose? You, you're from a generation that perhaps is thought of as quite sherry. So you know, are there reasons maybe they, they wouldn't? Yeah, I mean, I'm from a council estate in Essex, so I've just kind of been brought up to kind of say what I want and to hold the repercussions. So I think that's kind of why I've got away with a lot of I've got away with uh, my philosophy is better to ask for, for forgiveness than permission. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think, I think the thing does come from obviously just fear and worried about being judged. And obviously at the very point of your career, you don't want to go into a business and start off by saying, I have mental health issues. It kind of doesn't give you the stereotypical platform to then kind of leap off of. But I would argue that actually vulnerability is one of our greatest measurements of strength. Mm. So actually that should be seen as a massive thing. So if you have someone who's come to you and openly disclosed that they have a mental health issue, it'd be seen as a massive positive, that they are clearly trusting you with this information, mm. that they want to give all of themselves to you and be transparent. Yeah. Because I think that's what the younger generation really want. They want to see transparency and they want to see authenticity as well. That's really helpful. Um, Shala, do you want to add anything about why you, you know, obviously you had a difficult experience disclosing, but um, any other reasons or thoughts about that at all? I guess 
one of the reasons I don't disclose and a lot of people don't disclose is because we feel we can't trust people around us. Mm. And so you need to help build a culture of trust. And the reason I now feel comfortable to, dis to disclose and you know, I could tell HC my people manager is because we've created a culture where you feel comfortable talking about it and that's through consistent messaging. So having posters out by your printers stating where you could go get help, having visible partners or senior people talking about their story. Um, I guess for PwC we have, um, we created the Green Ribbon, Green Light to Talk campaign which the Lord Mayor Pill adopted. That was really important for me to see people across the firm wearing that green ribbon prepared to have a conversation and that created a, that's ultimately created a culture of people feeling like they can talk about mm -hmm. it which is why now I feel ready and easily able to talk about it whereas five years ago I didn't feel like I could do that. That's really interesting. So I'm going to move on to um, Yvonne to think about maybe disclosure at interview and also um, just turning that around as well perhaps. Uh, I've been told recently by some employers that um, interviewees at the end of interviews now are asking, you know, what are you going to do for my well-being as their question at the end, which can catch people by surprise if you're not from, you know, the same generation. So perhaps are there some things that you could say a little bit about disclosure at interview and talking about mental health at interview? Absolutely, thank you. Um, well, first of all, we have the power of storytelling right there, don't we? Um, I, I think in the real world, when we are looking at interview, which basically is shorthand for selection, I think actually it is very challenging to expect someone to disclose a condition um, that perhaps isn't visible. So when we look at the, you know, the, the disability spectrum, clearly if you has a, have a physical disability, mm -hmm and you require an adjustment, you talk about it. And that's something that's becoming you know, increasingly acceptable and normalized. I think that with a mental health condition, particularly at interview, when you are joining an organization, when you are a young person, you do not have a track record yet. You are, the, the power play, the dynamic is very much one of, I can do this, I will conform you are unlikely, as things stand right now, to disclose a condition that isn't critical to allow you to do your job, because clearly all disclosure is voluntary. So the disclosure funnel tends to narrow quite quickly when it comes to invisible mm. characteristics and considerations, and clearly, you know, mental health, um, I think is, is still a very challenging area. Yeah. Just to pick up your second point, if I may, yeah. um, on the, the question, which is actually what's in it for me. Um, again, I think use of language is really important mm. here, and I'm sure we're going to come on to it. But actually, to talk about wellness and to talk about what can you give me to allow me to fulfill my potential in this organization, mm. in turn for me giving you my time, my skills, etc. cetera, um, I think that that is to be expected, mm. and the dynamic has changed in that respect, particularly with you know, the younger workforce coming in. Mm. Um, but again, labeling it particularly around mental health as opposed to some of the other shorthands like wellness, well-being, um, productivity, allow me to reach my potential. Mm. I think we just have to be aware of the language, but the sentiment is the same behind the question. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, Sharla, do you feel able to say anything about talking about this at interview at all? Yes, yeah, so I guess um, my sister, we, I was having a conversation with my sister who was talking about disclosing um, to her new employer and what, what we need to know is where is that information going to go and how is it going to be used? So there has to be transparency as to if you're disclosing something, what's going to happen to that data? Is that to assist occupational health in getting you the right help and who is, it, who is going to see that information. It's a really tricky one. I think I've seen it dealt with really well and I've also seen it dealt with very, very badly because a lot of people have to rehash what they've been through in that occupational health um, chat. 
Um, so I guess there does need to be transparency quite early on as to how that information is going to be used and that young person has to decide whether actually they want to go ahead. But ultimately, whatever that young person decides, the organisation needs to support that. Either they disclose or not, the organisation needs to support whatever they do. Okay, thank you. So it'd be helpful to hear a little bit about what the, if you like, the youngest generation at work, um, what worries them most about well-being and mental health at work? Do you feel able to maybe say something about that, um, Daniel? Yeah, I mean, I think, that, I think the younger generation feeling a tremendous amount of pressure at the minute. I think um, I'm a social media specialist for Thomson Reuters, and social media definitely has a massive part to play in this. It's the idea of perfectionism, and then obviously that goes into pres 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 I can't even say it now. Presenteeism, is that right? Presenteeism, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, the kind of need to kind of feel like they're perfect and they have everything together and that they know what they're doing and everything all the time puts so much pressure yeah. on the young mind. And actually having real life examples of people at work mm. who quite clearly say, you know, my career journey was not as clean cut as this, you know, mm. it took me ages to get to where I am today, you know, and, and you have to essentially instill patience in young people and that's not easy. Yes. Um, but I think that's the key, is really honing in on, you know, things take time. Nothing's yeah. going to happen overnight. We don't have a magic wand. No, and that makes me think of some campaigns that schools and I think universities are now looking to do around um, sharing your failures. So um, letting people know when things haven't worked out for you. It allows other people sort of earlier on in their career path, or in the case of schools, for children to see that it's okay, things don't always go, you know, straightforwardly. And I think there's something about that, isn't it, to yeah. see that things aren't always perfect and you don't always progress along the path in a sort of narrow way, predictable yeah. way. Yeah, when you have things like Amazon Prime, you can get things delivered the next day, and you have Netflix where you, you don't have to wait a week to watch an episode, you just binge watch the whole thing. Mm. We've become into this culture where everything's just like now, 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 now. Mm -hmm. And that's just, unfortunately, the society and culture that we live in, and businesses have a role to play and you know assisting the young people in that absolutely okay thank you um shall do you want to say something about expectations generally about mental health and well-being at work what are the biggest worries you know what what do young people worry about when they're going to work i guess you're worried you're going to look weak and that it's not even so much about the senior level it's about the middle management what are the, how because they're the people you work directly with so what are they going to think of you and actually a lot of them are still stuck in some old thinking um so we, we don't have access to that senior level leadership, so we need to feel confident to speak to our middle management. So a lot of them won't get there um, or quick enough that we would like. So young people need to feel empowered to have those difficult conversations early on. And so I would like to see more soft skill training for those young people to have those difficult conversations, mm -hmm. to challenge that middle management function. Um, because. For instance, my parents, as I told you, I was raised in an upbringing where they didn't acknowledge mental health, and I love my parents dearly, but I've had to really challenge that upbringing, and a lot of young people are actually having to challenge their own upbringing, which is very difficult to do, so they need a lot of soft skill help to articulate themselves and express their concerns to the middle management. So that would be a really useful thing that employers could help provide skills around. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. Yvonne, I'm interested to know a little bit about... Um, when we think about what employers um, should, you know, provide, um, what do you think young people expect now when they're looking at where to apply for a job? Do you think, you know, it used to be that, you know, the location, of course, your career pathways and so on. Do you think they now look at mental health and well-being support as part of the package? Yes, okay. <laughs> is the answer. Okay. Um, but I think actually it's, it's again, it, it's a wider package of information. Um, and Daniel spoke about authenticity and, and transparency. Um, we conduct a, a lot of research around sentiment you know, in the workplace and what makes people um, apply to new jobs or indeed leave existing roles. And one of the um, really key drivers over and above pay and rations is culture. And I think actually when we talk about mental health, um, the evidencing an inclusive culture, be it directly or indirectly by proxy, by demonstrating that you are an inclusive employer, an inclusive environment, um, goes a huge way um, to the way that potential talent will, will view you. And if you don't evidence those points, there'll be an assumption that actually you don't do anything about it at all. So the transparency in the inspection is definitely there. Some of it, as I mentioned, is direct. So, you know, getting behind conventions like this, um, 
the governments, obviously, um, you know, the, the, the disability confidence schemes, um, proxy um, and membership of the BDF, etc. Um, I think by proxy, um, actually, with some of the more visible and well socialized characteristics, so gender, LGBT, um, there's a halo effect. So if you're doing very well in a certain space um, and you really have something to talk about uh, with really you know, seeing, driving that change and that evidence of an inclusive culture, then there is an assumption um, that actually you're doing other areas really well as well. So I think that signposting and linking culture and inclusivity to what that means for a young person coming in looking for the signposts, mm. that I think is a really helpful way of evidencing what you're yeah. doing. Okay, thank you. And so, Daniel, could you say maybe something about what young people might expect when they get to the workplace? You know, they're coming from an environment, maybe at university or even at school, where there may be, you know, counselling available or they've had support provided, you know, dedicated support. What do you think their expectation is when they transfer that to the workplace? Do they, you know, do they have expectations? Do they think it'll be you know, a, a desert with nothing? You're, what, what do you think, or what they should expect? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, when I, when I first joined Thompson Reuters, it was my first sort of main corporate job, and I had no idea what to expect, to be perfectly honest with you. And I think it's very much similar now, but in the sense that we have come a, a little bit further along in the sense that, you know, the uh, care facilities that you get at universities, my experience with people I know haven't been particularly great. Mm. So actually, they're going to be leaning on businesses more for that in the sense of like, you know, I, I want to work for you knowing that you have a package that if something happened, mm. I, I could use it. Um, and I think you'll find more and more going forward that those questions will be asked in the interview stage and that mm -hmm. could determine whether or not they take a job at your company or not as well. Yes. Shall I? Yeah, I agree. So the reason I was able to get treatment so quickly was because I have a private healthcare. So I was made to call, you know, AXA that day and within a week I had an appointment. Um, but I guess those, those offices aren't open over the weekend or during um, evenings. So young people need to feel that they can take time out of the work, work day and be supported to go do that. But equally, I guess you also need to be flexible about timings. So a lot of the people I see have an appointment in the morning, but that disrupts them for the rest of the day because they are still emotionally kind of... Um, upset by what's happened in that earlier therapy session. So actually giving them the afternoon, letting them have the you know, appointment in the afternoon so they can then take the rest of the work day out. I know a lot of organisations, um, Bank, um, Bank of England and I think, was it Ho Hovels? Ho and Lovells. Yeah, yeah, Lovells. Lovells. Given they, they have counsellors on site, which is incredible. But for smaller organisations who can't do that, having that private healthcare, but allowing the flexibility for those young people to go out and have those medical appointments is really, really vital. Really helpful. So flexible approaches to working, a definite expectation that the culture will be supportive and that there will be uh, practical things like counselling. Okay. And then just to finish really is in terms of these questions, it'd be nice if you could each say like what your top tip would be um, for employers. You know, if they got a take home and this was your miracle moment, you could say if I could wake up tomorrow and everything was different in this one way, um, what, what would you say, Yvonne? Communication. You need to socialise this, uh, tone from the top. You can be an ally, you can be a champion to actually get this conversation going in your organisations and raising an awareness of it. Okay, yeah. thank you. Daniel? Um, don't take uh, the uh, mindset of the younger generation lightly. Um, we're a lot more woke, is the term these days. Um, so we know when you're giving us BS and yeah. when you're being truthful. So yeah. I think the transparency of, like, you know, if you're actually going to do something, do it because you're wanting to do it very much like what the policeman said up here earlier, like genuinely care about doing it. Yeah. Don't just be seen to doing it because yeah. we can see through that. Can sense that a mile off. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Sure. I agree. Consistent communication. That We don't want to see communication just on World Mental Health Day or Mental Health Awareness mm -hmm. Week. We want to see it consistently. And that can also be through, you know, when I do due diligence, I look online. So PwC published their mental health strategy on their annual report. Put it on your Twitter so young people can see what you're doing and do it consistently. So that is what is going to nurture that culture of us being able to feel we can talk out. Yes, and as I said at the beginning, your values um, are what matter an awful lot to this generation and then they will be really loyal to you if they identify with those. So that is a fantastic message. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to move to um, audience questions now, I think. 
uh, and then we'll sum up. So now I've taken the specs off. Okay, so the top question um, is, do you consider that social media has placed additional pressure on younger people? Well, as you said, you're the expert. <laughs> so I'm going to come to Daniel first and then ask our other panelists. Yeah, 100%. Um, even just in image and how you look. Mm -hmm. I was reading something the other day, and I can't say this with 100% certainty, but apparently um, one of the Kardashians uh, photoshopped their four-year-old stomach in a photograph. Okay. And it's like, that's the level we're getting to with social media and how perfect and everything needs to be. Yeah. And I think a lot of, there needs to be a lot more education around social media and something that I'm actually quite passionate about in, in sort of being a part of the remedy for is that, you know, it's not real life. Yes. And there are just glimpses of people's lives. But when you see something consistently on a stream, you think, yeah. oh my God, that's what it is. Okay. Um, and actually it is putting a massive amount of pressure on younger people. And I think Prince William said it as well, you know, we don't actually know the negative, ev negative effects of social media yet because yeah. the people who are using it now aren't yeah. my we age. Don't have so it's, it's going to be an interesting, potentially scary time, I think. So. Thank you. Shana? That being said, I guess when I was struggling and I didn't have anybody I could talk to, social media was really important for me because I needed a visible, diverse role model. And so if anybody follows on Instagram, I followed this man called Hussein Manawir, somebody I can relate to as a Muslim person who was openly talking about mental health. And I followed so many mental health blogs, so many people talking about it, some of the people here, which I'm a you know, huge fan of. And so you can still use, men, um, use social media as a tool to have visible, diverse role models who will talk about it when you don't feel comfortable to do it in your workplace. Thank you. Yvonne, do you want to add I would anything? completely endorse that. I think that it's a double-edged sword, social yeah. media, yeah. and I think there is so much positive resource out there if, if you know where to go and find it. Yeah. And there's so much content being produced yeah. um, that I think that ho hopefully we can see it as a, a, a force for good and support, as well as a challenge in, in the ways you described, Daniel. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, so we've got another, okay. So one, one for Shala then, specifically about uh, what was done to change the culture of your team from one where people viewed mental health as gossip to the team it is today. I guess it's helped that I could tell him I met Prince William today. That's, that's definitely helped. Okay. Um, but I guess um, it's really difficult because I didn't disclose what the, the major thing that had happened in my life, and I don't need to do that. Mm. And so how I started it off was sharing things that the organization were doing. So before sharing my experience, every, every time an email would come around, I would share it around the whole team. PwC are doing this, PwC are doing that. And as I, some of them, your senior leaders, they are not gonna respond. But if you consistently do it every two weeks, every three weeks, they, although they're not responding to you, they're seeing it, they're listening and they're reading it. And now, I guess, two years down the line, now they're fully supportive of what I do, and now I can share the story, and they look back in horror to think, oh my goodness, we were gossiping. Um, but if, if people are gossiping, go to your HC. HC have a duty to help you shut that down. Mm. And that's what my HC team did. All they did was they spoke to the partner group and said, actually, you know what, this person is experiencing something. It'd be really good if you don't talk about this because it's not right, and that just shut down the, the conversation around, and around gossip. So just. I would reach out to those who HC leads to kind of help with those conversations. Yes, and persistent modelling of, of good behaviour in that yeah. sense is really helpful. Yeah. Isn't Can it? I just add one thing yeah. to that? Um, I know it's been referenced a couple of times today, but actually there, there's an element of you know, rebalancing what we mean by um, you know, physical. I mean, people would never gossip about someone having a broken leg, mm -hmm. um, but they may gossip about this slightly taboo subject and slightly, you know, whispery. Mm -hmm. So if we can just balance this concept of, of wellness and you have your physical good health and you have your mental good health mm -hmm. and really just continuing to socialise that and driving that, mm -hmm. I think that that will help yeah. Yeah. the quiet words in corners and yeah. mm -hmm. trying to yeah. work out what's going on, you know. And also just when I share my story, I always say good people do bad things. Um, it's not about that person, it's about the action. So we just need to model good behaviors um, because those people would be horrified to realize they Absolutely. did that. And I, I don't feel any sort of anger, but I guess we need to help educate um, on acceptable and non-acceptable behaviors. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm aware that we have about 20 <laughs> seconds apparently left. So just to summarize, it feels that communication 
uh, role modeling of great behavior from the top, so seeing people in a place where you're going to work being, you know, not just inclusive, but talking about the fact that it's okay to talk about mental health, they don't have to talk about their own. Um, and the fact that we need to do practical things like be flexible about appointments, um, we need to have the values that younger people uh, sign up to. Um, there's a, have I missed anything out? Are there any other things that we should emphasize? All right, well in that case, would you uh, thank my panel? Thank you very much.